Good morning, everybody. It is nine o'clock. Welcome. We are going to get started. Thank you so much for taking the time today to join us for this incredibly timely and necessary training on this beautiful Friday morning. This is a webinar training on the topic of going back to school during a pandemic, healing children traumatized by COVID-19 for parents and educators. And really it's a, it's a topic for everybody. My name is Gavi Berman. I am the Director of Community Outreach and Business Development here at Central Florida Behavioral Hospital. And I will be your host for today's CEU workshop today with Dwight Bain. So real quickly, before we get started, there is one announcement that I'd like to make. Um, I've met a lot of folks here on this call. We have folks from Orange County Schools, Osceola Schools, Seminole, Polk, everywhere. Um, many people use Central Florida Behavioral Services here. Um, and a lot of the conversation that I've had over the past year has been on doing more for adolescents, for kids. And that's why I think right now it's such a timely uh, a time to go ahead and to announce that we're going to be starting a virtual adolescent IOP this coming September. It's really just something that we've thought about doing for a long time. There's always been a little bit of a need, um, but we've really hit this point. I think everyone can agree where we need to kind of step in uh, and provide that support in the community that Central Florida Behavioral Hospital really has become known for. It's my job here as the Director of Community Outreach to identify issues that are happening within the community. Um, for those of you that know and that use us for our, our current IOP services, we do provide virtual IOP and PHP services for adults. So that, that service is led by our excellent program director who many of you know, her name is Kim Hornack. She's going to be spearheading this initiative as well. So we have a tentative start date for now of Monday, September 28th. We are going to provide this service via Zoom, schedule-wise Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And the, initially, the program is going to be specifically for adolescents. So we're gonna serve the ages of 14 to 17. Of course, if we have a, a child or an adolescent that's outside of that range, but meets criteria where they could benefit from being in that program, we would certainly um, review that. And then additional details are gonna follow as we come closer to the start date. And I also wanna tell you that the only reason that you know, we're doing this is because I've had so much input from the community, people that have reached out to me and people that share with me issues that they've identified within their community. So I just wanna go ahead and, and tell everybody I appreciate that. You know, we couldn't provide the services that we do provide and meet the needs of the community without your feedback, without knowing what's happening and affecting your communities directly. So I absolutely wanna encourage everybody if you'd like to collaborate with here with the hospital on this particular program or get more information, we'll certainly make an effort to get out into the community to provide information as details become available on, on you know, exactly how the program is going to look and how to make a referral, et cetera. But in the meantime, I just want to encourage everybody, uh, you know, it's a two-way street, we'll get out to you, but please, uh, please come to us as well and let us know issues that are going on with you and how we can help you um, and benefit the needs of, of your community. And with that, we'll go ahead and jump in with a couple of housekeeping items for this webinar. Um, the, today's webinar workshop is one hour long, including the Q&A, which will be done at the end of the presentation. Dwight will open up for Q&A when he's ready. All participants will be muted. We've got over 400 people, uh, believe it or not, on this webinar. So to open the phone lines would be very, very difficult. So what I'm going to do is encourage everybody to please use the chat function for any questions. The chat or the Q&A is fine. I'll go ahead and just monitor all the questions, answer what I can during the, the, during the webinar and leave some for afterwards for Dwight to answer as well. Also, this webinar is being recorded. Um, many of you who have been on here before are familiar with our, our resources center on our website. We have a collection there of resources, particularly for COVID related that uh, from Dwight, different um, CEUs we've done in the past are recorded as well as, uh, as uh, other material and resources. You can, this, this webinar is being recorded and we will upload this webinar there so that you can go ahead and watch it again or share it with other folks who, who weren't able to make it for this live recording. Also very important, when this presentation ends, you're gonna receive the prompt from your web browser and it might look like a prompt that you would probably normally ignore or close. It looks almost like a sales prompt, but it's not a sales prompt. What that is, it's a prompt coming from Zoom that's going to bring you to a, a, a Google survey to complete a survey, which is the webinar evaluation. So when you close the when you close Zoom, or if you uh, leave if you leave Zoom or close out at the end, that'll automatically bring you there. Please make sure you complete that. 
Also, eligible attendees will receive a one credit, uh, one CE for uh, participating in today's um, in today's presentation. We'll we do our best to issue those and, and get them all input into CE Broker within 30 days. I get a lot of emails from folks asking about them. I want you to know that if you've provided me with your license number, which is one of the questions when you register for the pre the uh, presentation you provide your license number. So if you've given me that number, unless there's, if you forgot to do it, or perhaps you gave me the wrong one, we are going to get your information input into CE Broker and you will be issued that credit. So you don't have to worry. And then finally, the certificates of completion, everybody here will, will get a certificate of completion immediately following the end of this webinar. I will send out an email along with additional information, uh, which Dwight will hit on too about our next upcoming CEU. He'll talk about the, that though towards the end of the presentation. And with that, I'm gonna hand the mic over to our CEO, Vicki Lewis, who many of you know, uh, to introduce the speaker and to say a few words. Good morning. We partnered with Dwight to provide this educational series in April on the impact of COVID on our lives. Little did any of us know we would still now be in August, continuing to address the ongoing effect of the unclear future this pandemic has brought to our society. Our goal is to present information that does not create fear. Instead, we want to present to you Dwight Baines, who provides insight and tools for our participants, educators, parents, and professionals that will help our children during this very, very confusing time in our lives. Dwight, as many of you know, is the founder and the president of LifeWorks Group and is nationally certified as a counselor in practice since 1984. His primary focus is on solving crisis events with creative solutions. Dwight is a trusted media resource who has been interviewed for over 500 radio and television stations, as well as quoted in over 100 newspapers' websites, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Atlantic Journal, Orlando Sentinel, the Miami Herald, Newsday, Fox Business, and MSNBC. Dwight, it's always a pleasure and an honor for me to present you to introduce you and to ask you from our facility to provide the tools and the resources that that you do so with that i'm going to turn it over to you jump in to a presentation that i believe affects all of us in one way or another because so many of us have children, grandchildren, we have friends, neighbors, individuals asking the question, how can I get my children, my friends, my, my nieces, my nephews back to school safely? As you can see on the screen, we're talking specific to the idea in a pandemic time, how do I get children back to school? Preschools. I mean, schools are where so much of our foundational learning and growth takes place. So today as we're going along, I want you to understand this is a very high content presentation by design. So if you're thinking specific to a five-year-old, I want you to take notes on that part. There's too much to try to capture everything we will send if you registered by email. A very detailed email follow-up with checklists, signs, symptoms, coping skills, how to create support structure. That will come to your email box next week. But for today, it's about helping scare, scared and, and, and traumatized children. If, if we were on location at Central Florida Behavioral Hospital near SeaWorld, I would say turn to somebody next to you and talk about your first day of school. What do you remember? What do you remember on your very first day? Was it a good day? Was it a pleasurable day? Was it a painful day? The clinical research I looked at, as well as talking to folks, most people can't remember, with two exceptions. If it was the best day ever, I mean, just the best day. You remember that? Uh, it was just fantastic, and I just, I knew where my cubby was. I knew where to put my new lunchbox, my backpack. Mom got at Target. It was a great day. But if you were like me, I remember that day vividly. I remember the sidewalk 
I remember holding on to mom's leg. It was a painful day. What about the children of COVID? What are they going to remember on their first day back to school? Some schools have already started, some start next week. What are they going to remember? And at the moment, the research, kind of scary. The United Nations did a global study and they said we're facing a generational catastrophe in education because schools have been closed in 160 countries since March, affecting a billion students. The estimate right now is nearly 24 million children and young people could drop out or have no access to the idea of learning and growth. The United Nations said we need education because it's the great equalizer. We need it more than ever. When we look at this, every community with a school closure is, is facing challenges and the children are facing difficulty. But the research shows us the harm in poor communities is much worse because so much of a child support system comes from a teacher and teachers, uh, so many teachers become the most influential person in a child's life beyond their own parents. When we look at this, the longer schools are shut, the longer children are out of school, the more likely they will either quit school, start working, uh, and some cultures get married, but most of the people that quit school will be girls. We know that education is the greatest path out of poverty, but we also know, again from the United Nations report, they said reopening the world's schools safely, now there's our word, safety, these children have to be safe. The teachers have to be safe. Administration has to be safe. They said it won't be cheap, but it's nothing compared to the cost of letting the largest generation in human history grow up in ignorance. You see, taking schools away, no education. The research tells us the risk of keeping schools closed and just not doing anything far outweigh any benefits. At the moment, maybe 60% of schools are going to be reopened. They call it brick and mortar to be back on location, get on a school bus, go to location. And we're gonna talk about how to do things safely. We must take bold steps now to create inclusive, resilient quality education systems fit for the future. Children need to learn. Why do we go to school? Learning, growth. Why do we go to school? Community, connection. Why do we go to school? Emotional, behavioral, and psychological development. CNN did a report from uh, the London School of Hygiene and Topical Medicine, and they said COVID testing, contact tracing, the resources and the things we've been talking to children about, hand washing, hand sanitizer stations, temperature checks, wearing masks. I know that's uncomfortable for little guys. Some schools are, instead of using masks, they're using the clear face shields, so you can see somebody's face. But the research shows us it can be done safely. There's another piece. Right now, this was in the Wall Street Journal two days ago, child care and school closures because of coronavirus have a greater impact on women's employment than men's. And you'll see the numbers when we look at the difference between moms and dads. For moms, 30 to 35%, depending on the age bracket and looking at the week, one third of moms unable to get back to work. For dads, it's 10, maybe 15%. If we take a look at this, particularly for single parents, being able to get back to school provides them the opportunity to get back to work. Children draw their greatest sense of emotional security and strength from their parents. Next, extended family like grandparents, aunts, uncles, but they also draw security from a place called home. Dorothy was right when she clicked her heels three times. There's no place like home. What if mom and dad lose their job? And what if the house goes into foreclosure? Children also draw security from the same school, teacher, classmates, peers, little league team. So what happens when there's an economic crisis? I describe it this way. What happens on Wall Street is not as important as what happens on your street. Children don't worry about global economic indicators because they don't understand it. And they're not supposed to be worried about global events because they're just kids. Parents don't have to be worried about global events because you can't control them. Listen, a parent's primary responsibility is to manage their home, their children, and not be worried about world problems. 
when your children see you as a caregiver modeling healthy behavior, they'll do the same because children tend to do what children see. And we want to model safety, emotional strength, and how to move forward. How to do that safely. The first element we'll look at in getting kids back to school and what that means. And when I talk about back to school, understand it doesn't mean that you have to put your child on a school bus just like it used to be, back to normal. We'll talk about the words back to normal in an upcoming time of training. We're talking about learning and growth. And for some people that will be back in a classroom. For other people, it will be electronic. It will be using Zoom or other uh, uh, television or video based platforms. My wife is a teacher and I went and toured her school last week. And I was impressed at the steps that were taken for the children coming back to school, her school offers the hybrid model. You can come back into a classroom or you can stay home with a video platform. Many schools are utilizing that option. Some are 100% on the video platform. Some are 100% back in a building. But as you'll see, if you look closely in this, on the slides, there are temperature check stations going into each building. There are plexiglass for the little preschoolers between their spots and their cubbies on the table. There are plexiglass shields on every desk in the high school, the upper school. And I was impressed as I toured through how the cafeteria had been retrofitted and changed. There was signage on the floors. Can it be done safely? Absolutely. Absolutely. The New York Times has a wonderful section. I've given you the web link at the top of the page of how to utilize the guidelines that, the, that, that we have been given how can we safely not transmit a virus that is more contagious, 10 times more contagious than the flu? Can it be done safely? Physical distancing. Can it be done safely? Face masks, face shields. Absolutely. Remember the word, safety. And I hope that you'll check out that guide. It's a free resource for the New York Times. But as I take a look at that, can it be done safely? Yes. If you want more beyond the New York Times, which they did a fine job, go to cdc.gov or coronavirus.gov, and it will talk about physical safety for children. But what about the other side? Because we know that 75% of mental health conditions will develop by age 24. By the time most kids would be finished with their college years, if they're going to have a mental health condition, we'll be able to see signs and symptoms. Identifying things early, isn't that what we do with heart disease, breast cancer, awareness? We pay attention to early diagnosis of diabetes because the sooner we can diagnose a physical symptom, the more likely we can treat and the greater the outcome. Well, it works the same way. Early screening of depression, anxiety, ADD, OCD, complex grief or trauma. You can identify that in the school system. I know that there are school counselors, guidance counselors as part of our training time today. And I wanna thank you for what you do. Remember, most of what a child draws in terms of support, early developmental education comes from home, from mom and dad, their extended families. But they draw a tremendous amount from school and at school, if there's going to be an issue, we can spot it so we can do something about it. We'll talk about that because you see physical safety, essential. We have to do that. We have to follow the guidelines. And part of that for a viral condition like COVID-19, the coronavirus, it's transmitted virally. Face masks can be done. I talked to one teacher who said, we're going to have a contest every day who has the coolest face mask. She works with second graders. And so what is it about a seven-year-old that wants to wear a face mask? They're uncomfortable. Well, we have to show safety. Many of you may remember the safety of seat belts. I'm old enough to remember when cars did not come standard equipped with seat belts or airbags. And there was a learning curve of getting the general public used to the idea of wearing a seat belt. Why? Safety. It's not that we think you're a bad driver, it's that accidents happen, it's a safety issue. And it's the same with face masks now. It's a safety issue recommended by the government, required in most schools, because a viral condition can simply, by following some clear physical guidelines, 
not be transmitted and you'll be fine. You can move forward with life, not be afraid. Millions of doctors, nurses, first responders, healthcare workers do not, NOT not, do not catch diseases because they follow safety protocols, physical safety. What about psychological? What about psychological safety in a time of pandemic? And the very specific question, and the very hard question, when I talked with Vicki Lewis a, a few weeks ago, and she said, we have to do something to help these children because it's not concern about physical safety as much as it is psychological. Does COVID-19 traumatize children? I think the answer is yes. If you're a counselor, you're familiar with the ACEs score. If you're not, let me explain it. Because an ACEs score identifies traumatic events in childhood that can linger into adolescence and adulthood. 46% of children in the United States have experienced at least one ACE, which is some type of trauma that the child has experienced. Now look at number one, according to the National Survey of Children's Health, economic hardship is the number one challenge that faces children. Do you think that the coronavirus recession will impact children? I believe it will. I know that recessions, foreclosures, repossessions, it impacts children and it's the number one thing psychologically because if mom loses a job, dad loses a job, we lose our home, well, what about insurance? What about healthcare? What about going to the dentist? Those things go away. The, the second most common is the divorce or separation of a parent or guardian. And when we look at that, we know that during the extended lockdown with coronavirus, there were many couples that said, I cannot be with you anymore. The coronavirus extended lockdown, the isolation desperation, as some people called it, revealed gaps for some, gaps in their budget, gaps in their income ability, gaps in their skill set with their career. But for others, it identified gaps in their relationships. It magnified what was already there. It just exposed what was already there. And for some, they will choose to end a relationship and it elevates a child's ACEs score. There are eight of them, separation, divorce, when a family breaks up because it means less access to both parents. Children need a mom, children need a dad, children need to feel love from the adults in their lives. You say, well, we'll be divorced and they'll still get to see their grandma. Sometimes grandparents are the greatest loss to a child after a divorce because of so many hurt feelings and polarized emotions. Well, you can't go see that grandma anymore. She's not a nice person. I'm not here to determine if grandma's nice or not. I just know that children need as many people as possible to love them, support them. What about when grandma died? Maybe grandma lives with us and she died because of coronavirus. That elevates an ACEs score. A parent who goes to jail or prison, a parent or someone in the family who is mentally ill, suicidal, severely depressed, more than a couple of weeks. Mental illness affects the entire family. That's why we need behavioral centers to stabilize, to help people heal, to help people recover. If somebody has a drug or alcohol problem, it affects a child. It elevates that ACEs score, which elevates their, their, their risk for mental health issues or psychological issues the rest of their lives. Witnessing a parent, a guardian, another adult in the household behaving with violence, slapping, hitting, kicking, punching. Domestic violence hurts children. They don't understand, why are you hurting my mom? If they were ever the victim of violence in their neighborhood, shootings, neighborhood issues, and economic hardship, either often or very often. And one of the biggest ones that we hear is food. I'm so thankful for groups like the Christian Service Center that created the Love Pantry to feed children because many children get school-provided, government-sponsored lunches but sometimes they don't get breakfast. And when school was closed, these local nonprofits stepped in to say, let's make sure these children have groceries. Let's make sure the family has food. Not having those things, it affects a child psychologically. Now, here's a key principle I want you to pay attention to, because we're going to look at signs and symptoms of children from infancy through college years. I want you to pay attention to the child in your life, the child you're concerned about most. 
friend of mine told me that, you know, he had five children and somebody had asked him, which child do you love the most? And he said, I, I, I love them all, but I love the one the most who needs it the most, the one who's hurting the most, the one who's struggling. And the principle is this, you will always miss what you're not trained to see. Did you get that? You'll always miss what you're not trained to see. The research from Harvard tells us that children are more distressed when parents appear helpless, passive, but children draw strength, resiliency when they see their parents take action. Now, if you're a parent, if you're an educator, if you're a guidance counselor, if you're a therapist, you do not have to have all the answers. <sighs> but take a breath. You do have to model for children. Here's what we're going to do next. I call it NRT, <laughs> the next right step, because the next right step means being able to know not everything. What's going to happen at Christmas? I don't know, but I know this. Here's what we're going to do today. Here's what we're going to do today. You'll always miss what you're not trained to see, but if you're feeling overwhelmed, that's totally normal. That's why the next time, the next training event, we'll talk about moving from numbness back to feeling normal and how to create a, a neurological pathway, a process, so that you can just feel okay every day back to normal. But if you're still feeling numb, okay, let's look at the trauma. These are the things, if your family, your child has experienced, these are the things I want you to pay attention to. These are the symptoms of somebody who's been traumatized. And coronavirus has been the, the, the in some ways, the, the largest crisis that any of us have ever faced. Yes, I know the terrorist attacks of 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Charlie, Hurricane Ivan, Dennis, I know some people have lived through tornadoes and fires and floods. Those are crisis events. School shootings like Parkland, Columbine, concert shootings in Las Vegas or even in our own neighborhood, the Pulse Massacre. Those are crisis events, but they didn't go on 22 weeks. They're not projected to go on 18 months. The number one thing you can ask people about, how are you sleeping? How are you sleeping right now? If someone says, I'm sleeping pretty well, that's a good indicator that their brain is able to recharge the neurological pathways with serotonin, which occurs naturally when you get deep REM sleep. Asking people, do you get anxious when you think about what's happening? Do you see people withdrawing from friends, family, not taking care of their pets, individuals that are feeling grief or guilt or shame or strong negative feelings? See, some people get very anxious. Other people get very angry and irritated, agitated. Some people are just traumatized. They feel a sense of horror. Now, listen, these are normal. But I want to move past these normal signs and symptoms to show you how to climb out so you don't feel helpless or hopeless. Some people talk about during the coronavirus lockdown, gaining a lot of weight. Other people were not able to eat, right? That's an indicator that we watch for in adults and children. How are you sleeping? How are you eating? How's your energy? Those are the three big questions to ask. Paying attention to those allow you to move forward and see, all right, those are physical signs and symptoms. We can look at some of the psychological. And then not just in adults or teenagers, alcohol abuse, substance abuse, self-harm, cutting, suicide, can and does occur in children, sometimes as young as six or seven years old. I've been a counselor over 30 years right here in Central Florida, and I can tell you I've seen more suicides since the COVID-19 lockdown began in March than I've seen in my entire career. And this coronavirus, the pandemic, will be with us maybe another year. Take a breath. We're going to get through this. Let me say it again. We will survive this. We will get through this, and we'll get through it better together. But if you're not able to feel happiness or laughter or love, if you just feel numb, those things are normal for everyone. But let's look first at the littlest, the youngest infants and toddlers. 
if you're concerned, are they affected by coronavirus? Are they affected by the psychological indicators? We know now the CDC.gov reports less than 1% of people diagnosed with coronavirus, less than 1% are dying. Good news. You, your child, your family, highly unlikely to die from the pandemic. But the psychological impact, I believe, affects everybody in some way. 330 million Americans. Children that before were potty trained and now they've lost control of their bladder or their bowels. They had gained some skills, now they don't have those skills. They're extremely clingy, cranky, temper tantrums. Those are signs the child is feeling trauma. What about for preschool? They go back to security blankets. They go back and you think, he's acting like a two-year-old and he's five. He's sucking his thumb again, what's happening? Why age appropriate or inappropriate? Well, they go back to age inappropriate because they're telling you psychologically, they don't have the words to tell you, here's how scared I am, dad. Sometimes a child will feel guilty. Maybe I'm doing something that's making my mom so scared about money. For others, they're terrified of being abandoned by their parents. Or, and I talked to one family and they said that for them, their six-year-old, was feeling so scared that mom and dad would die from the coronavirus because they had the news on a lot. And they were talking a lot about the coronavirus and how people die. The child had made the determination, is my mom gonna die? Is my dad gonna die? Well, if they're gonna die, I don't wanna ever leave them. I wanna be right there. For some children in the preschool age, very aggressive, temper tantrums that make no sense. Yes, it does. You'll always miss what you're not trained to see. When they get into the early elementary, sometimes the signs of children that have been traumatized through this process, they're extremely sad, weepy, or terrified. It's kind of like the preschool, but it's elevated a little bit. For some, it's just continual crying and sobbing, and you're unable to console them. But remember, if a child starts to cry out, and letting them cry out. It can be the beginning of them learning to talk out. They're still very young. They don't understand how to put a label on it. There was a term I learned in grad school called, if you can name it, you can tame it. And teaching children, this is what sadness feels like. This is what disappointment is. Being able to help them understand. Coronavirus is a highly contagious viral disease. And the good news, most people won't get it. Let's follow the physical guidelines. What about a child when there's a cough and they're just terrified? Maybe we're at Publix and somebody coughed and they're just terrified. Oh, they got coronavirus. Helping them to calm down, to get facts from trusted sources. That's why coronavirus.gov or cdc.gov, it's actually the same webpage. And teaching the children, let's look at the science, let's look at the medicine, let's learn about the physical elements so that you can feel safe. When we look at this early elementary stage, for some, it's afraid of the world ending because this is a stage of life in developmental psychology when a child starts to understand death and dying, when a pet dies, and maybe they're terrified that everybody will die. They may become overactive or act irresponsibly because they're trying to not think about coronavirus. They may be disrespectful, rude, hateful. Those are just warning signs a child's been traumatized. In some families, the child may feel ashamed or different because their family takes coronavirus risks more seriously than other people. Mom, we wear our mask. We have hand sanitizer. We wipe things down with Clorox wipes, but this other family, they don't do anything, Mom. And I felt weird. I had a chance to interview in preparation for our time. A friend of mine has a 12-year-old, and I said, could I ask him some questions? His school had already gone back in. And he said, sure. And so I said, putting on my interviewer's hat from all the years I was a radio talk show host, and I said, help me understand. By the way, that's my favorite question with young people. Help me understand. Help me understand. What's it like to walk back into a classroom where everybody has a mask? And being able to hear from his 12-year-old mindset, here's what 
he wasn't afraid. He was a little concerned, but he said, you know, life seemed to be getting back to normal. What about older kids, adolescents? This is a hard time anyway. I mean, their hormones are changing from age 13, 14. The hardest year for girls age 14 and for adolescents because they draw so much of their emotional sense of worth and value from their peer group. It hit a lot of teenagers hard because they didn't feel like they had an identity anymore because they drew identity either from their friends, they drew identity from sports, their activities, extracurriculars. So we saw a lot of loneliness these last four to five months. Remember, these are normal signs and symptoms because when they've lost contact with their peer group, the hard reality is some of them will never see those peers again. When a dad loses a job, when a mom is unemployed, sometimes, sometimes they let the lease go because they're just trying to keep up with student loans and they move back in with grandma and we move to a different community and, and now there's a new peer group and there's grief and there's loss. For some teenagers, they fear the loss of stability and security because the parents aren't available to help them because the parents are so completely overwhelmed. It's, this is hard. This is the most extended crisis event of our lifetime. Other teenagers feel like I need to grow up and get out of here so I'm not a burden to my parents financially. For others, it's I need to grow up and get out of here because this place is falling apart. I don't feel a connection to my family. I think I'll move in with my friend's family. And that loss of identity, the, the child who drew so much of their strength from being a straight A student, captain of the cheerleaders, captain of the football team, and now there's no football and there's no cheering. And that child, the overachiever, feels like they've lost who they are. Some teenagers are terrified about their own financial future. Or maybe they were working a job, but it was at a fast food restaurant that's closed down. Or maybe, will I even have enough money to go to college? Some teenagers feel preoccupied with guilt over how they feel obligated. I, I need to go find work. You know, I'll mow grass. I'll do something. Mom, I'll help. I, I, I'll be there. Some Young people feel chronic fatigue. They can't concentrate. And I want you to watch for this. They might have chronic headaches, back aches, stomach aches, unidentified physical pain. Now listen, the physical pain is real. It's completely real. Psychosomatic induced disorders are real, but it's coming from a psychological element. They can talk about the physical. You go to the doctor, I just don't know what's wrong with her. Maybe it's because they feel deep grief and loss. They don't know how to mourn the loss of normal, old normal. And for some, this is the first time they've seen the world as a dangerous place. Before it was fun. I could go on TikTok. I could make something fun. I could follow my friends on Instagram. And, and now the whole world is a dangerous and scary place. It is in some ways. But if you take a breath, COVID-19 will end. We'll get through this. Now, these signs and symptoms are not just for children from infancy through about age 20. This is for you and me. How are you doing? <laughs> My wife used to like to watch a TV show where one of the characters from New York would say, how you doing? And every time I think of that phrase, I think of that silly character. But this one isn't silly. How you doing? How are you doing physically? You'll receive the full signs and symptoms list by email, but how are you doing emotionally? How are you doing cognitively? Can you think clearly? Is your mind focused? Are you able to make decisions easily? Do you have good concentration? Do you feel a sense of, you know, I think I'm functioning pretty well. One day a week, I'm an executive coach helping people with career change and there's an exercise we do called a dashboard, and it's a series of 12 different gauges, think gauges on the dashboard of your car, to look at different areas, physical, emotional, behavioral, learning, growth, relationships. How are you doing spiritually? How are you doing in connection in your career? I know that during coronavirus, one of the things that has occurred, in fact, we had a training session on this. It's posted on the Central Florida Behavioral Center website. 
is through the career change process. Some people, because they're thinking clearly, were able to say, you know, I'm, I'm more valuable than this company pays me and I don't see a future here, but I think I can reinvent. If you're thinking cognitively, you can do something. Michael Lewis, the author of Moneyball, he calls it when to jump. And if you're thinking clearly, that's kind of a fun process, kind of an exciting process, if you can think clearly. If you don't have concentration, you'll just feel numb and sometimes make bad decisions. There have been so many terrible accidents, car accidents, these last month or so as people have gotten back to work and such. And you think, why, why did they drive through that red light? That makes no sense. Why were they not paying attention? Because their brain is numb. Driving an automobile under the influence of alcohol or drugs is illegal. What about when somebody is so emotionally numb because they've got student loan debt, their company's laying them off, they don't see a future? I want to I wanna remind them, take a breath. We'll get through this. COVID-19 will end. Behavioral, and remember, this is adults as well as children. When an individual is completely overwhelmed, sometimes they'll make some terrible decisions behaviorally. They'll do or say things that are rude or hateful or completely inappropriate. Why would they go to an addiction? It doesn't make any sense. Drugs, pornography, gambling, alcohol, violence, throwing things. That's not going to solve the problem. It creates a new problem. Why? Oh, easy answer. They're overwhelmed. This is hard on everybody. So how can I move forward to build resilience? Now listen to these and let's apply it to everyone. And that's why I'm so thankful we get to spend a few minutes together so I can remind you, let's talk openly about mental health. I'm grateful for Vicki Lewis and community leaders who, who have reminded us, it's okay to talk about mental health. We talk about physical health. If I slipped and fell down a, a, a step, we go, oh my gosh, let's get to the orthopedic. Let's get an x-ray. Physical health. Oh, you have a cough. You have a fever. You've lost a sense of taste or smell. Let's go get tested for COVID-19. I've had that test. Maybe you have. Okay, that's physical safety. Good. Psychological safety is to be able to talk openly about mental health just as we would physical health, to educate our children about stress and to openly talk about stress in our home. So let the kids know it's okay to talk about your feelings, especially as they're a little older. There's no shame in saying I'm scared. I remember during Hurricane Charlie, the electricity flickered out and we were in a small enclosed room. It was actually the laundry room of our home. We had a dog that was howling. Sheila, my wife, our children, we all remember that well. We remember we got through it. It wasn't shameful to say, this is scary. What are we going to do? We're going to be in this room. We're going to listen to Z88.3 on our transistor radio. And we're going to get through this because that's what families do, electricity or not. We're going to make mental and emotional issues a normal part of life. We're going to talk early in life to late in life. How are you doing? One of my favorite questions to ask adults or teens. We're going to talk about supportive conversations. Remember the principle. If you talk through it, you can get through it. <sighs> Take a breath. COVID-19 will end. But the lessons that you and I learn, the lessons that we practice with our children, those lessons they will remember always. Now, here's what happens in a pandemic. Some people panic. Who knew that during, you know, the, one of my kids would watch a, a TV show about zombies and the apocalypse. And it was kind of dumb. I watched it a couple of times. But in that setting, you needed clean water or melee weapons. In this pandemic, who knew the toilet paper? Well, okay, take a breath. Because in a, in a time of panic, some people go numb. They just freeze. Other people get very afraid and they hide. They're terrified to do anything. Other people run away from it. And that's where the addiction piece comes in. For some, it's to fight. But the best option in a time of crisis, and I, and I wish this was not here, but it is, and how do we get through it? Flow. 
keep moving forward toward growth. Flow. How do I flow with it? It's to remember today. Yesterday, yesterday's a mystery. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow is unknown. But today, today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. How do you help children of any age Ask them how they're managing the stress and just listen. Don't offer opinions, just listen. Being together is better than isolation, especially because there were so many months of isolation, desperation, reassuring guys we're safe. We're practicing the guidelines from the doctors at the CDC. It's the same guidelines from John Hopkins University, the World Health Organization. Pick your group of experts, but listen to the doctors, listen to the surgeons, listen to the pediatricians, listen to the, the scientists. Millions of healthcare professionals go to work every day and do not, NOT, not catch the coronavirus because they follow physical safety protocols. And if you follow those, you simply will not get sick. Psychological safety, just as important, but letting the kids know we practice safety. Okay, wait a minute, <laughs> we need to wipe that down and teaching them how to do that, they'll be healthier and better the rest of their lives. Now notice in the middle of the slide, explaining to the children, I am not super mom. I'm going to need your help. It's okay to ask for help. Un mas tiempo, one more time, let me say it again. It's okay to ask for help, you're not super parent. And being able to say, I'm gonna need some help with this. Even a small child can learn how to put their laundry in a laundry hamper. It will not hurt them to help the family with tasks. I need your help with the dog. You know what? Help me stir this up in the kitchen. Crisis brings out the best or the worst in children or parents or partners or family members. So let's give each other a lot of grace because we're all going to need a lot of grace since this will go on for months. But stop judging people. And if you haven't already done it, take a look at social media for a few minutes or however you need it, or whatever you need it for, and then skip the social media and skip judging people and skip having opinions about other people. What works for our family is the goal, safety, physical and psychological. And being able to do that and standing firm on what works for our family. I'm not worried about other families. They're not my responsibility. Safety first, safety only. We're gonna show compassion on families who have COVID positive family members. And we're gonna teach our children kindness. We'll show kindness to other people, but we'll never be snarky or mean or hateful. I like the idea of a check-in, how you holding up, what happened today. Instead of what happened at school, it's what happened in you. What happened in you? Allowing emotions to flow prevents emotions from blowing up in rage or blowing into resentment or self-destruction. Listen, nobody gets through a crisis alone, especially kids. So reassure people that traumatic emotions are normal reactions, right? Normal reactions to an abnormal situation. I'll say it again. It's normal in an abnormal. That's why I'm giving you the list of all of the different indicators, because I want you to understand and please openly talk with your children, your students. This is what happens to anybody. This is what happens to everybody. But together we can get through it. Because if you talk through it, you can get through it. There's an important principle to remember in resilience. This comes out of the work of pediatrician Ken Ginsberg. He said, when children learn resilience, he identifies seven. This is from the, also at the American Academy of Pediatrics. Competence, confidence, connection, character, contribution, coping and control. We'll do an upcoming training on those areas of psychological resilience, but confidence and confidence means I can get through this. Mr. Rogers would describe it this way. Anything that's human is mentionable and anything that's mentionable can be more manageable. When we talk about our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less upsetting, and less scary. Talking, that's the key because everybody has mental health issues. The healthy people are aware of it and they take action to manage it. Everyone has physical health, 
Everyone has psychological health. Everybody. The healthy ones pay attention to their physical health, proper nutrition, oxygen, sleep. They get exercise. They have patterns. You can identify if a person is physically healthy. BMI, body mass index, HDL, LDL, resting heart rate, blood pressure. There are indicators that tell us if this human body is healthy. Guess what? They're indicators. We talked about them in the last training. They're indicators to identify emotional health, psychological health, and mental toughness. Do you know what you feel? If I ask you to, to identify what's the pulse, do you know what you feel? Do you know what to do about those feelings? The World Health Organization describes mental health as a state of well being where an individual recognizes their own abilities. They can cope with the normal stresses of life. They can work productively and they're able to make a contribution. Do you know what you feel? Do you know what to do about it? Because mental wellness is something that can grow in a pandemic if you protect your mental health, sleep, hydration, exercise, meditation. If you become curious about situations, instead of furious, don't be easily offended. Curious instead of furious. I wonder why she's so cranky today. She never gets cranky. Curious instead of furious. Knowing how to say no, learning how to speak up, knowing how to identify and say, here's what I need in this situation, maybe from your partner, maybe from an administrator, but ultimately knowing how to unplug and recharge and restore your own mental health. I do that in nature with prayer. I walk 10 to 15 miles a week. During the coronavirus pandemic to this point, I've lost 25 pounds. My wife's lost 20. We ramped up our self-care because we knew this was a long haul. And when you take time to do what the flight attendants say on my American airline flights, and yes, I'm flying again and, and traveling and speaking with groups and felt totally safe, physical safety has been well established. Our family went to Walt Disney World for the first time a few weeks ago, felt totally safe because of physical protection. Physical safety can be done and so can psychological. But what happens if a child, because we talked about those ACEs scores, what happens, if, what happens if that trauma keeps building? That child becomes a young adult who has continual problems. They may never live up to their potential. They may be more prone to depression, anxiety, broken relationships, shattered jobs and careers, physical problems. But I like kintsugi. It's the Japanese art form. When a dish is broken, when a dish is broken, they mend it with gold. Because sometimes growing up in a shattered home environment full of stress, sometimes those kids are gold later in life because they understand how to deal with high stress situations. Some of the research says that children that have grown up with high ACEs scores have psychological strength. They have, they're faster in their ability to shift focus. They don't lose accuracy in managing multiple tasks. They become more creative, more cognitive. They know how to get unstuck when facing the big questions, where to work, how much to invest in a relationship. They have a high tolerance for ambiguity. They understand the in-between stage of life. They don't get caught up in perfectionism and things being a certain way because they've learned how to flow with life, right? That's the resiliency we talked about. They sometimes can better look at a situation and make rapid decisions because they have their perspective that can fuel perseverance. There's a neurochemical called norepinephrine. We'll talk more about it in the next training. But the higher the norepinephrine, the more energy they have to do creative things. Let me give you some examples of that. Jim Carrey, 10 years old, wanted to be a comedian, mailed his resume to the Carol Burnett Show. At 14, his dad lost a job. They moved into a VW van in a relative's yard. He started working at a factory job after school to help his parents. Dropped out of school at 16 to do comedy full-time. When he was 19, moved to Los Angeles. Wrote himself a check for $10 million. Put in the memo line for acting services rendered. He dated it for Thanksgiving 1995, the year that Dumb and Dumber came out. He kept the check. He put it in his father's casket. The difficult time that Mirsha Baradan witnessed in Iran when her parents were political prisoners and they came to the United States when she was 10. She went to BYU, graduated from NYU, 
her book, The Color of Money, about women of color in the banking system, committed or inspired Netflix to commit $100 million to support black communities. When you look at people facing challenge, Shania Twain was two years old when her parents divorced. When she was eight, she started singing to make extra money to help her family. At 10, wrote her first song. In her teenage years, was working to feed the family. At 21, her mom and stepdad were killed. She stopped everything to take care of her siblings and raise them. And when the last one graduated high school, she went to Nashville. She has sold over 100 million records, making her the best-selling female artist in country music history. You see the process, I call it face it, feel it, grieve it, grow resilient. It's like a beach ball. If you stuff emotions inside, they will keep growing and expanding and explode. But if I face it, what am I feeling? What's going on? And I can talk about it. Grieving some things, but as we talk through it, we grow resilient. Now, please pay attention and help the teachers. The stress is everywhere from this pandemic. It will get worse before it gets better. We all have stress. The COVID stress can be destructive, and some of these teachers are haggard, and some of them it's going to affect their physical health. We'll talk more in the next training, but there's a cellular level that occurs that leads to inflammation, sickness, disease. What about parents? For some parents, they're so overwhelmed right now. Pay attention to the parents. Pay attention to your partner because addictions. One study showed that over 76% of parents who stayed home during the lockdown were utilizing alcohol every single day. That's why we need treatment centers. People turn back to addictions to manage the pain, but you remember the principle, you can't choose your circumstances. You can choose your response. Because when I look at World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, Katrina, the Great Recession, families have had to learn to adjust. Children learn by what they see and the adults around them. When we talk about neurological pathways, there's only three steps, and you can change this from stress to strength and mental toughness because life skills are built. You're not born with it. One of the great resources I found in the, in the preparation for this, and I spent several days just looking at the clinical research, was from Sesame Street. Sesame Street has some fantastic tools to teach children how to become resilient. What can you do? One grandma said, I'm writing notes, love notes to my grandkids. I'm reading. Grandparents can be a great resource. Even the ones that are in assisted living facilities, you can write notes. You can send text messages. You can learn how to FaceTime. You can be an extended support because there was a little boy whose dad moved away and he was only five. His name was Jules and a friend named Paul McCartney because the dad who moved away was John Lennon. Paul McCartney wrote a song, Hey Jude, don't look so sad. Take, take a sad song, make it better. The number one song the Beatles ever had, Hey Jude. Billboard magazine said it's the top 10 rock and roll song of all time. And maybe, and it's the longest song, it's over seven minutes. And maybe it's because in a time of pain, the reminder was, you can take a sad song and make it better. <laughs> I love Elmo. I found in my research that Common and Colby Cabez do a belly breathe. And I've done it several times in preparation for our time because it's how to belly breathe, how to become more resilient. The final piece, the final piece I have to share with you, I did not know this part of the story. It's called the Pack Horse Library. In 1930, less than one third of the people in Kentucky could read, less than one third. My grandmother, my grandmother, and Kentucky would always tell me, she was a school teacher in the Head Start program for 42 years, and she would tell me about the nice people who came on horses to bring them books, because I was born in southeastern Kentucky. I was born in Appalachia. And what I found out is during a time of Great Depression, people would come and help children in the community, and one of them was my grandmother. And my grandmother always taught me to read. My grandmother, my grandmother said, there's an answer in a book, go find it. You see, I know about children who grow up in crisis because I was born in Appalachia in a very poor family in a very difficult situation. But in the 1930s, the Smithsonian Foundation said, let's go help. Let's give children the ability to read. Let's give them hope. And today, today we can give people hope. 
Obviously, we don't have questions, but if you do, send me an email. You see, we're not in this alone. We're in this together. I understand what it's like to feel kind of scared as a kid. I understand what it's like to research and find answers. You'll receive a detailed email follow-up of signs and symptoms, coping skills, but if you get stuck on other things through social media or email, I'm here. And remember, Central Florida Behavioral Hospital has committed to making our community better and stronger. And we're committed to that. That's why there's a resource page at the website. In fact, Gavi, why don't you tell us about the resource page and, and upcoming resources that we'll make available to our folks? Thank you, Dwight. Thank you for this, this excellent training. Um, you know, you, you, you've said that um, you don't see things or you don't, you, you miss things that you're not trained to see. And, you know, that really, really resonates for me. And I'm sure it resonates for everybody that's on this call. And we, we're so thankful to have you to train us and to train everybody in these very trying times to be able to identify issues um, so that we hopefully don't miss things and we're able to help people. In regards to the Resource Center, this video will be posted, it was recorded again, it will be posted on our resource center, which I posted the link for there in the chat box. I also posted the link to our Facebook. I encourage everybody to please go to our Facebook page and like and follow the page. That's really the easiest way for you to stay in the loop on future upcoming trainings with Dwight and for any, anything that's going on with the hospital, any news such as our adolescent IOP, that'll all be posted as things come out and as we fine tune that uh, program. And also in terms of the, the next CEU, uh, we'll have a, another CEU, Dwight mentioned it, it's on going, on, uh, going back, what is the new normal uh, on neurological pathways that Dwight mentioned. We have a date, we, we do not have a date yet scheduled, but that will come shortly. We'll have a communication go out next week for that as well. And with that, I want to say thank you everybody for joining. We're, we're super thankful uh, for everybody you know, joining these webinars and, 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 and it really just demonstrates your desire to help yourselves and help the communities that we serve. So thank you all. Thank you for spreading the message. This is why we do what we do. Thank you and have an excellent weekend and we'll see you next time.